Good morning. I'm Kevin Captain, Volusia County Community Information Director, and I want to welcome everyone to today's special interview coming to you live from the Volusia County Sheriff's Communication Center and Emergency Operations Center in Daytona Beach. This is a continuing series dealing with the many facets of the coronavirus pandemic. We've discussed so much about COVID-19, but the one thing we haven't really talked about is the pathophysiology of the virus. Now, don't worry, that word pathophysiology, it sounds more complicated and perhaps daunting than it really is. But here to simplify it down to the most basic elements and to make it at an understandable level is Dr. Scott Cleos. Dr. Cleos uh, is, is here to share all that information with us and it's gonna be great. And there's actually so much great information that we're gonna split this interview up into two easy segments. So good morning, Dr. Cleos. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning, Kevin. Good to be here. It's great. Before we actually start, too, I just want to say, too, that our production team here at Volusia County Government has really put their pairs of hands on the oars to get this interview and make it possible and to incorporate your videos, and I can't thank them enough. I, so I agree. It's this a great is, team. There's a lot of elements that are involved with pulling this up, and if it actually works, I'm going to be really, really impressed. Uh, because, so. I'm sure it'll work, I'm, yep, okay. because these guys are these you guys don't are do great. Anything, you don't do anything halfway, Kev, so I'm <laughs> confident it's going to work. Well, so. thank you. So Dr. Scott Cleos is a diagnostic and interventional radiologist. Dr. Cleos received his undergraduate from Virginia Tech and his medical degree from uh, Eastern uh, Virginia Medical School. From there, he did his residency and fellowship at the University of Florida. Do I hear some cheering out there for UF? I think, I think we do, right? He's board certified in radiology, and he practices mostly within the subspecialty of vascular and interventional radiology. Dr. Cleos works with Radiology Associates Imaging, a group in Daytona Beach, and he carries out most of his clinical practice at Halifax Health's main campus and Level 2 Trauma Center in Daytona Beach. So Dr. Cleos is married to Dr. Andrea Cleos, who we've had here on, on panel interviews and part yes, of our press has. conferences. And, and I imagine she's your CEO, right? Yes, she is. She <laughs> makes all the decisions in the house. That's fine. And, and you have two kids? Two kids, yep. Stevie and Juliana. Stevie Both and Juliana. Right now. And your entire family, you're, you're very athletic. You're very, uh, you guys are very much into physical health. We, we do try to maintain our health. I mean, this all goes back many years for me personally. I'm 56 now, and back when I was in my late 30s, early 40s, my daughter was uh, an infant, and I went down to pick her up one day, and I felt an electric shock go down both of my legs, and I'm like, okay, I'm too young to start having back pain. So that's, for me, is when I really started getting into doing a lot of physical fit fitness, trying to take care of myself, because what I do, I see the ramifications of neglect over time. And now, I'm now at that age where you start seeing people, my cohorts, people my age, succumbing to their bad decisions from 20, 30 years ago. So, yeah, we do try to take care of ourselves. It's important. And in that, that physical health plays a huge role into COVID-19, and we're going to talk about that, I imagine. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, so, Dr. Cleos, tell me. How on earth does a radiologist like yourself get so incredibly knowledgeable about COVID-19 and, quite frankly, so enthusiastic to teach about it? Okay, well, first of all, I'm not an expert. I know you <laughs> claim that I was are. an expert on COVID-19, but I'm not. Um, actually, I'm, I'm not very bright, and I need a lot of pretty pictures to make things that are complicated You brought those with you today. So what I did learn how to do is make those pretty pictures, <laughs> and that's how I got into this stuff. So I find you know, all things in medicine and medical history fascinating. Uh, it's kind of a hobby of mine I do on the side. I've got a YouTube channel where I post these different videos, and you know, I've shared those with you. Um, I was an engineer at Virginia Tech before I went to medical school. So that I, was very, I didn't know. Yeah, I was an electrical engineer. So, you know, I'm in radiology, which is very technically oriented, has a lot of uh, physics in it, which is uh, interesting to me as an engineer. Well, you would and get along with our county manager because he used to be a physics uh, instructor. Really? Yes, George like, Rechtenwald. I'd like so, to meet him. Yep, yeah, we're going to have to do lunch someday. Yeah, so, you know, this was kind of a natural uh, evolution for me. I got into the, you know, the video production. The first video I ever made, I was at UF, and I was trying to describe the, uh, the uh, physics of X-ray production. And I try to get some kid over there make a video for me to demonstrate the concept of what we call bremsstrahlung, which is when the electrons come across the, you know, the tube and they basically run into the anode and they produce an X-ray. And he spent a couple of weeks and gave me this just very primitive video, charged me $400 for it. I'm like, 
I have Ouch. to learn how to do this. Okay, so if I do it myself, then I don't have to ask anyone to do it for me. So that's how I got into this stuff. Pretty fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Well, so let's start by um, how did coronavirus get its name? I mean, because we know it really doesn't have anything to do with that carbonated hoppy beverage, no, right? No, it does not. So what I want to do is play this first video right here and okay. just kind of show you guys what the, you know, the nomenclature. So if we could bring that up onto the screen here. And so we're talking about the current coronavirus, all right? And that came out from Wuhan, China, and that was December of 2019. And uh, basically, it was similar to the SARS, let's stop the video right there, similar to the SARS uh, virus that we knew from 2002. And SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Okay, so that's what SARS comes from. All right, let's continue with that video, though. And basically, the, remember when this thing first came out, it was called 2019 NCOV, which stood for Novel Coronavirus. They knew so it was a new virus. Every letter in the nomenclature has a, it stands for something. It stands for something. That's exactly right. So before we had a formal name for the coronavirus, this is what we called it, the Novel Coronavirus. All right, let's continue with the video. So in January 2020, they actually came up with a formal name, okay? This is the virus, SARS-CoV-2, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, okay? And it was called Coronavirus 2 because we already had a SARS-CoV, all okay. right? That yep. was the we 2002. We already had the part one, if you will. Yeah, we had the part one, all right? So that's the name. Now, let's stop right there. COVID-19 is the disease that is caused by the coronavirus, okay? So SARS-CoV-2 is the actual virus. Okay. COVID-19 is the disease. Associate, right? that, that's caused from the virus. That's, that the virus causes. So let's continue with the, with the video here. So even though we're talking about COVID-19, we're actually more uh, we're discussing using it wrong. disease. We're using okay. it wrong, and I'm gonna show you why here in a second, okay? So let's continue with that video, and we're gonna go to that next uh, screen. All right, stop right there, just for a second. So 2019 SARS-CoV-2, that's the virus, all right? The disease is COVID-19, right? Just like we yep. said. So if you go back to 1981, when HIV came out, you remember what HIV stands for? Uh, Human immunodeficiency, immunodeficiency virus. virus. Okay, yes. so that's the virus, all right? And then that virus causes AIDS, which is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. That is the disease. All right, let's stop right there. Now that's de demystifying right there. Okay, so this is, this right here is how, we, when you say someone is COVID positive, that's not the correct term. You're not they're, COVID they're positive. They're SARS-CoV-2 positive. They're SARS-CoV-2 positive. If they have symptoms and they're, you know, showing symptoms of coronavirus, then they're COVID-19. They have COVID-19. But I see in the literature everywhere, the CDC, I think, uses it incorrectly. You don't say someone is AIDS positive, right? right. Right. They're HIV positive and they have AIDS or they don't have AIDS, gotcha. okay, two different things. So that's the difference. So if you could say someone's SARS-CoV-2 positive and be completely asymptomatic, COVID-19 is the disease. All right, let's continue with that video. All right, so we're gonna go through kind of some of the history here. Um, that's just kind of an example of how the nomenclature. So 2002, SARS-CoV was the original Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, okay? So the SARS-CoV stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. I don't know what happened to the video, it went away oh, on nope, us. Nope, there it is. Okay, oh, it started over. All right, we're gonna play it again. <laughs> All right, we're back where we were. So SARS-CoV, and that stands for Severe Acute, as we said, and that's the SARS-CoV or the virus that causes SARS. This is good though because you know you're kind of giving us a little bit of a history and differentiating between what you name the virus and what right. you name the disease that's, that's exactly associated right. with the and virus. And that's what I want to get you know kind of get that out of the way first. Okay. So let's go on there's another virus that came out in 2012 which is related to all these. So this is now called SARS-CoV-1 because we have a SARS-CoV-2, right? Okay. So in 2012 we have MERS which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. I remember that. Okay. And that stands, the virus is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. Okay, so they're all coronaviruses, all of these. And they're just different, you know, species of the coronavirus. Now, 10% mortality associated with SARS-CoV-1. We know that retrospectively, how many people? 30 to 35% mortality with MERS, COVID, all right? So we know that retrospectively. COVID-19, we don't know the mortality. It's right too now. early yet, it's right? It's too early, and I don't think we have a good denominator, we don't have a good numerator, so we can't really tell you, you know, 
how many people are dying because we don't know how many people actually have it. And the initial reports that came out, they were talking out of Iceland where 50% of people who, had, who were SARS-CoV-2 positive were completely asymptomatic. They didn't have COVID-19. So it's going to be interesting when we retrospectively look at all of this data of how many people are actually going to die from SARS-CoV-2. That's interesting because yeah. it's, it's like you're looking at a bunch of people uh, some have the virus, carry the virus, but are asymptomatic. Right. Then some that develop into the disease, and all in through that process, we're testing people, right? But this but is the, the problem, you know, and then, and then daily we hear, oh, there's so many positive cases. So many. That's it, what we want. That's not the big picture, That's though. not the big picture. It's how many people are dying from the virus. And the first time a virus goes through a community, it's going to be most devastating because it's the first time the population has seen this virus, and it's going to take out those who are genetically susceptible or have baseline diseases that are going to make them more susceptible. So, you know, the daily reporting of how many positive cases in Florida and the United States means absolutely nothing. Because, you know, the herd immunity is what we're after. And you only get herd immunity by getting some exposure. And then hopefully that's going to be better than a vaccine. You know, we're going to build up our own immunity so that we don't get sick from SARS-CoV-2 and develop COVID-19. So speaking of herd immunity, how does that work? So the community has to get, get exposed to the virus, right. right? Then they build their antibodies to it. Then, then the virus can't really spread amongst the rest of the herd. Exactly. Is that how it works? That's exactly right. It's herd immunity, you know, and that's what, you know, you talk about that with vaccinations, especially with the more deadly diseases. If you got people who don't want to participate, that kind of defeats the purpose of herd immunity because there's going to be elements of the population that are going to be susceptible and can then spread that to, you know, sicker individuals in the population. So is it fair to say that by the time we get to uh, an effective vaccine that there will be some degree of herd immunity already? I think I've already had this. I never tested. Oh, really? Yeah, I think I did. We'll talk about that in a moment. But I don't intend to get the vaccine this year. And I do get the flu vaccine every year. because I, I do had, too. I had influenza back in my first or second year in medical school, and I thought I was going to die from it. So I never want that again. So is that man flu? Huh? Uh, <laughs> is that man flu? Is that man? What is man flu? Man flu, man flu. You know, that, I had it too. Oh, because you, you just you exaggerate your symptoms because you're a man. Yeah, I think that's what it was. I really thought I was going to die, <laughs> but, but I am a man, so I probably did you know kind of uh, you know exaggerate a little bit. But you know, and I think in subsequent years, if we have a resurgence of this virus and it comes back through the population, I would consider doing the vaccination at that time. But I would you know, too. I, I don't think I'm going to do it this year because I think I've already been exposed to it. You know, Interesting. And I'll explain why in a moment. So um, I think everyone knows what DNA is, right? Okay. And um, you, you had you you had explained before that this this virus has genetic material inside it. Right. How do how does that work? Well, let's just follow. Let's play this next video. Okay. And let me show you this about just the virus in general. These are all just viruses. And the first thing you're going to see on the screen, this it is looks called like a bacteriophage. A yeah. This is a bacteriophage. And it's basically a, um, it's basically a virus that infects bacteria. Let's stop the video right there. So you have a head that contains genetic material. And like you said, you can have DNA. There's another type of genetic material called RNA. So DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA is ribonucleic acid. You know, we have DNA. Viruses can have DNA, they can have RNA, all kinds of versions. The rest of this virus is basically designed to protect and transport that genetic material. That's all a virus does. Okay, let's continue. All right, so again, this is a bacteriophage. This is not going to infect a human. It'll infect bacteria. Now, I'm glad it doesn't because that just looks, it looks horrible. It, it does. Well, this one looks bad too. This is the coronavirus, okay? And this is what this looks like. And it's a spherical enveloped virus. Let's stop the, right there. And you can see that it's got all these little different spikes on top of it. These are called spike proteins. And there's other proteins on there. There's little blue and red and green dots that are uh, demonstrated in this particular uh, animation. And those are the. Um, uh, uh, membrane proteins and capsid proteins and then the big gray area is called the envelope. It envelopes the entire genetic material. It's like a sheath around it. It's like it. a sheath around it. So all of these different proteins are potential targets for a vaccine. All right, So they can look, get a vaccine to the spike proteins or the envelope or whatever. So that's what they're looking at right now. Now 
let's keep going with the video. So the reason it's called the coronavirus is all those little spikes look like a crown, and that's why it's called the coronavirus. Hence the name. Hence crown. the name. Okay. So if you look inside of this, all right, oh, let's wow, stop cool. right there. That's the genetic material inside the coronavirus, all right? And viruses, like I said, they can contain DNA, they can t contain RNA. Our virus is going to have RNA. We're going to get into that in a moment. Let's continue with the, vi uh, the video. All right, they don't have the ability to produce proteins, though. Okay, that's what they lack, all right? We're going to show you that in a minute. So viruses have genetic material, but no ability to produce protein. So they have to use the protein-making machinery of a host cell to reproduce. All right, and that's why they infect us. So if you look at this, this is a host cell, and then you got the bacteriophage, and we'll say that's a bacterium, and these tail fibers look for certain uh, markers on the cell surface. Once they find them, they attach to them, and then the virus basically injects its genetic material into the cytoplasm of that cell. So you can see that's the genetic material coming out. Once it's inside of that cell, now it can use that genetic material to make more copies of the virus. All right, so you see them popping up, and I'll pop, 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 pop. I'll make the you know noise for you here. <laughs> and then they bud out, and they spread out, and then they can infect other cells in the body. Okay, or you know you can repeat the process, and they infect more, and this is how we build up more viral particles, which just makes us sick. Or you can cough them out, sneeze them out, defecate them out, get out of the body, and they can infect another host. So the whole purpose of these viral particles is basically to infect you, reproduce, and spread themselves through the population. Interesting. That's all they do. So I think everyone has heard DNA. They know what it means. And, and from biology class, some of, some of us know what that like spiral staircase looks like, right? Uh, now, you said that RNA is inside the coronavirus. Yes. So it's instead of the spiral staircase, it's a, it's like cutting it in half, so to speak. Yeah, right? it's a single strand. So that's one part. Single okay, so, strand. So what we have, and we're going to show you this in a minute, is the double strand that kind of wraps around each other like this, and that's DNA, which makes it you know more of a stable uh, configuration okay. for reproduction and for what we call translation and uh, you know converting it into proteins. It's more accurate. Because which makes sense because I always again I go back to that spiral staircase case it's it's strong it's yeah. it's it's paired together yeah. right is that okay yeah so um, we know that our body is made up of million or maybe billions of these cells and inside they have the DNA yes and they're constantly uh, reproducing right every single day yep um, but with this virus if it's got only half it's got RNA and it it, Here, it, can it can't it can't reproduce right I can, I can clarify something okay. it can reproduce but it can't do that on its own it has it, to do that inside us. of us all right that's why it has to infect us so um, just to before we get into this right now just remember you remember there were there um, we're really getting into the biology now but the remember the base pairs in DNA can you remember yeah, the CGT perfect thing. I love it okay so DNA oh, a long time I ago. love <laughs> it oh, you got it man this is great so there's the G C T and A and they stand for uh, adenine and thymine and uh, guanine and cytosine so okay? and then the A and the T always hook up together and the G and the C always hook up together. That's in DNA. Okay. But going back to that spiral staircase, that's like you're building the steps to it. Yeah, so exactly what it is. So if you have a G over here, it's going to connect to the other side. Kind of like a, two Legos that yeah. you're putting together. And if you have an A over here, it's going to connect to a T. And that's okay. the whole And then staircase. you build the staircase. From of those four little nucleotides, they build all of us. Okay, we can make all the proteins in our body. The RNA, on the other hand, has one substitution. It has the A. It has the... G, it has the C, but instead of the T, the thymine, it actually has uracil. So the A connects to the U, the G connects to the C. And I'm telling you guys that right now, it's confusing. I know, it sounds it confusing. Yeah, so let's play the next video here. Okay, you, gotta, you, have, you have a visual that'll I make hope, this. I hope this is going to make this better. <laughs> and I want to thank you for our interpreters over there. I think they're doing a fabulous job. <laughs> so. It's complicated. So if you look at this cell, let's stop right there. Uh, actually, back it up for me, if you could, back to the beginning. Let's go back to the beginning. All right, so this is a cell. And again, the dark area in the center is the nucleus, all right? The center of the, the cell. The center of the cell is the nucleus. Everything around that cell is cytoplasm, okay? The nucleus has one function, to protect our sacred DNA, okay? Since that's what makes us up, every cell in the body has a nucleus that protects its DNA so it doesn't get damaged, all right? Outside of that nucleus, in the cytoplasm, 
you're going to have all of the machinery that's used to reproduce that cell, to make proteins, to make enzymes, to keep the cell alive, to feed it, and so on and so, so forth. So around that black eye, if you will, all that space contains like, uh, when you say machinery, it's like an assembly line it's making like assembly what you line. said proteins. Yeah, okay, so let's okay. go ahead and continue here, and I'm gonna kinda go into some detail with that a little bit right here. So we're gonna go in and we're gonna show you some of those things out. That's the DNA, all right? So that's the double-stranded DNA inside that's the, the nucleus. That's the staircase, all right, the spiral that's the staircase. staircase. And the cytoplasm contains these organelles, or things like lysosomes and ribosomes, and let's stop right there. So these are lysosomes are important. They help this, the the um, they help the cell digest food, material that comes into it. And lysosomes are almost like stomach acid. All right. Okay. So that's what they're used for. Ribosomes are the protein producing elements or the uh, organelles inside the cytoplasm that read that DNA and actually produce proteins, which makes us. Okay. We're all made of protein. So they're all the those, that's all the machines. That's the machines. Okay. Okay. So. Keep going with the video. I'm here. almost thinking that this is like a, an assembly line of a car factory. Yeah. I'm just trying to kind of yeah. make it make sense. So those are all the uh, machines making okay. making the products. That's the exactly right. So the DNA never leaves that nucleus, but somehow that information has to get out to that ribosome so that it can make protein. All right. So the DNA never leaves. So the way that cell, our cells go about that is they actually have something called RNA polymerase or transcriptase. It's uh, kind of but if you go in and we look at what this does, and I'm going to just separate everything except the nucleus and the cytoplasm with the organelles, and this RNA polymerase basically reads our DNA, and as it reads it, it produces another form of genetic material called messenger RNA. Okay, that's the ribonucleic acid. mRNA, or messenger RNA, can leave the nucleus. It goes out into the cell, into the cytoplasm, and now the ribosome reads these base pairs of this RNA, three at a time, and assembles one of 20 amino acids, which you see right there, which basically makes a protein, okay? So and is it like making right, a duplicate right there. copy? It, the, the messenger RNA is a duplicate copy of our, of our DNA. Okay, so it's like putting a mirror on it, and then and then making building making the other the, the opposite st side of the stairs. And because you have two sides, you know it kind of can it has a check, you know a check and balance, so it can actually make a very reliable copy, which will be important when we talk about the virus okay. and how it reproduces okay. in a minute. So let's go back to that video, and what's coming out of there are these a series of amino acids. And what happens is these fold into these complex three-dimensional configurations of protein. So you know when you cook an egg white. Mm -hmm. And that egg turns into, you know, it kind of fluffs up. It and like denatures the denatures. protein, right? So that's this folding of these proteins that you see right here. They and the heat causes that. The heat causes that. But these actually, you can actually get folding of the proteins just naturally inside our bodies. And these are the things that basically build us and make our enzymes and everything that causes us to function. Hormones, all these things are based on this process right here of... Uh, reproduction and protein pro uh, uh, reproduction and protein production. Not that it makes sense here, but is that also what causes like mad cow disease, where it's a protein that well, that's shapes exactly the wrong. right. Okay. That's a mad cow is kind of like it's called a virin. It's it's sort of like a virus, but a little different. But it can actually take over stuff and start making these different proteins that can infect the brains of these cows and humans and actually cause disease. Yeah. So for the purposes of this, if it if the virus is getting into the cell and it's it's Imagine if this was an assembly line in a car factory. It's hijacking all of our cellular machinery right. to, to, to make copies of itself. That's exactly right. The virus, all it has is genetic material. Cannot make any protein. So let's show the next video. So it's I'm like breaking into uh, one of the motor companies and starting up the assembly line and making... Making your own car. <laughs> exactly <laughs> what it is. Okay. Like, oh, you're coming into the Ford factory and making Fiats. You know? <laughs> I like that. So. What I'm going to show you, is this the next video? I yes, it is. <clears throat> Protein production. Yeah, this is the next video. So the coronavirus comes in and somehow has to get into our cell. And we don't know exactly how this happens. It may fuse with the cell membrane is or it, it may spike? do this. But the spike is important. I'm going to show you in a minute. I'm going to show you a process called endocytosis. So what happens is, is that the virus actually comes in and in, in in gets engulfed by the membrane of the um, host cell and then gets encapsulated into something called an endosome or a vesicle. 
All right, mm -hmm. so let me go play it a little bit further and I'm gonna stop it. So this now contains the entire virus inside of an encapsulated little vesicle. It's in right? our cell right now. In our cell. So it's it broke through that envelope that you said before. Okay, let's stop the video right there. Yeah, so it didn't break, it kind of came in, got incorporated into, and there's endocytosis, the normal process that happens in our cells, that's how the cell eats. Okay, so material comes in that it needs to function and, and to grow. Kind of like Pac-Man. Yeah, and it basically sucks these things in and these endosomes come in. Now, we've got ways to digest those. So now the virus needs to get its genetic material out to our ribosome, right, for protein production. We already talked about that. So let's continue with that video. So this thing is the lysosome, all right? And the lysosome comes over and it fuses with that endosome and it dumps all its material in there. And this thing contains proteases, which break down proteins, and it's got a pH of about four, okay? So it's a little acidic, kind of like our stomach acid, okay. right? So once that thing comes in there and it will fuse with that endosome and it'll dump this liquid content inside of the endosome. And once that happens, you start breaking down all of these surface proteins, all right? So you're gonna see this contents and they come in there. I'll turn that a little bit yellow, and you're going to see the breakdown of the spike proteins and the envelope and this uh, membrane and the capsid. All right, let's stop right there. So it goes in there and like kills it. It, it basically starts breaking down these or proteins, denatures them, digests them. Okay. So you know one of the things that they talked about early on is uh, hydroxychloroquine, right? Yeah. As a treatment. So the theory behind that is it actually raises the pH of that lysosome so that it can't function. All right. So is that, would that be like hydroxychloroquine is like Zantac or like an antacid or something like that? It's like, like an that? antacid for our cells. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. so that's why supposedly it can, you know, stop the virus from being digested. If it can't be digested, it can't deliver its, its uh, chromosome, right? Or its, uh, its, its genetic material. All right, so let's continue. So now what's going to happen is you're going to break down all those proteins, the, the endosome and the virus membranes will fuse, and then you're gonna dump that little cellular, that uh, genetic material out into the cytoplasm. So now it is available for protein translation, all right? And so let's talk about this for a second. This is a single-stranded positive sense RNA genome. It contains 30,000 nucleotide bases. Let's stop right there, all right. So remember I told you the nucleotide bases are those four little sequences, the yes. G, the U, the, the A, the, and the C. The steps okay? to the staircase. So this one has 30,000. We have 3 billion, okay? That's just for comparison. We've got 3 billion in our genetic code. And the smallest viral particles may contain a couple thousand. So this is somewhere in between, you know, closer to the viral end. All right, so let's continue. So basically this is a positive sense RNA virus or a positive sense code. And what it is, it's identical to this messenger RNA. Okay, so the, 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 the uh, stop right there. So the, the genetic material as it comes out of the virus looks just like that messenger RNA that we talked about before. Okay, so since it looks just like it, it can be read by our ribosomes. All right, so this can now be translated into a protein. By right? our stuff again, by our, our ribosomes. Machine. Okay. All right, so let's continue with that, with that video right there. All right, so it can be read and translated by the host ribosome. And we're gonna show that, I might be the end of that right there. So let's stop right there and we'll go back. So now, the thing about it is it can now be read, all right, but it, there's no way to reproduce that particular genetic material. Okay, I can make a protein out of it, so right now what we have is the ability to make one more virus, right? Because I have a piece of genetic material that can go to the ribosome, I can make protein, and I can basically reproduce that strand, but that's all I can do. I can't make another viral part So in other words, it, 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 the, the, the viral process inside our body with coronavirus is going down like one part of an assembly line to get to get to this point, right. but it has to go into another part maybe to do the finishing touches That's of it. That's exactly right. So let's show this. Well, how about we take a quick break because my mind is, is, is uh, the, the, the neurons are You're firing. <laughs> so let's take a quick break and we'll come back and then we'll do part two to this and, okay. and you can explain the, uh, the finishing touches of, we might of have making to have a that part BMW. Three and part four too. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to get through all this, but that sounds perfect. So. I'm Kate with Volusia County Community Information, and we are here with Jill from Volusia. Hi, I'm 
Kate with Volusia County Community Information, and we are here with Jill from Volusia County. Hi, I'm Kate with Volusia County Community Information, and we are here with Jill from Volusia County. Hi, I'm Kate with Volusia County Community Information, and we are here with Jill from Volusia County. I'm Kate with Volusia County Community Information, and we are here with Jill from Volusia County Community Information. Manual, <laughs> yes, manual can opener, because if the power goes out, you will, you'll starve. Um, and you want to make sure that you have uh, those items. And you want to put, other than the water, you want to put all of your items in a airtight container. Because if uh, it rains or whatever, you want to make sure that everything is, you know, all put in the airtight container. Another really important thing if the power goes out is to have a flashlight or two, right? And extra batteries for them. Because you don't want to uh, go without seeing the food that you're going to eat. And again, during an emergency, we are used to watching the news or checking the internet, but a lot of times we do lose our power. So when that happens, a weather radio is a really good thing to have? Absolutely. You want to get a battery power operated uh, NOAA weather radio that will let you know when there's imminent danger in your area. Fantastic. And then what about those basic medications people rely on every day? Because in an emergency, you may not be able to get to a pharmacy for a couple weeks afterwards even. Right, so you wanna make sure that you have your prescriptions on hand. You have enough prescriptions for at least two weeks to get you through the disaster. And then I also see over there you have some tools. Why do I need hardware tools, Jill? Well, <laughs> good question, Kate. Uh, just in case you have to turn off some appliances or you have to turn off some of your utilities, you wanna make sure that you have some on hand and you don't have to go rummaging through your garage in the dark because you forgot your batteries for your flashlight. You wanna make sure that you have those. Sounds good, and then rummaging through the dark sounds kind of dangerous. Sometimes we do have injuries when we're at our house, especially if the power's out. So first aid kit? Absolutely, Kate, a first aid kit. You wanna make sure that you have some triple antibiotic ointment, some uh, gauze, band-aids, and, and all that stuff in there. All the basics, great. And then uh, money too, right? Some cash, which I know we all rely on our credit cards, but during an emergency, cash is important to have? It's very important to have cash on hand during an emergency, especially in small increments, um, because you, if you have, if the ATMs go out and you wanna go you know, get some perishable items or wanna go buy something, you don't wanna pay $20 for a loaf of bread. So make sure that you have some extra small bills on hand too. Good, and then if we're talking about being home, if we're powers out, we don't have anything else to do, let's talk about games. I know Wits and Wagers, Jill. It's one of my favorite board games. Uh, I'm not bored when I play Wits and Wagers, <laughs> but any family game or a deck of cards or even some of the games you play when you're on a road trip, you know, the ABC games and things like that. You wanna be able to have to do that because you're, you might be unplugged just because there is no power. Yeah, well, so these are really great items for your basic kit, but then there are situations where you may need extra items depending on your situation. So I live on the beach side and during a hurricane, I have to evacuate. So that means I'm going to a shelter. So what other items should I consider in addition to my basic kit if I'm planning to evacuate to a shelter or even a friend or family member that's not my own home? Well, you're gonna wanna make sure that you bring a sleeping bag, maybe a pillow um, and comfortable clothes and then personal hygiene products. You wanna make sure that you have the necessities that you need to be comfortable. So you're gonna to wanna to bring those. That makes sense. And then I also know if I'm leaving my house, I wanna make sure that I have all of my important information in one place. And I know that you have this sealed in a bag. Right, so the reason why I have this sealed in the bag is um, because um, you don't want water getting to your birth certificate, your marriage certificate, your social security card. Um, so you wanna make sure that you have that. Also, you wanna put all of your documents from your computer onto a little jump drive and bring that with you as well. And sure, and I know that I'm probably not gonna keep that in a kit all year round, but it's important to have all of that information in one place stored together that's easily accessible so you can just grab it if you need to go quickly, right? Especially if you don't have it in the cloud or don't have access to the cloud, 
if Wi-Fi and power is down. Right, and then we talked about evacuating to a shelter, a place that may not be your own home. And with the COVID-19 situation right now, personal protective equipment is really important too. So we have some face masks here, some gloves, some antibacterial wipes, hand sanitizer, those things that we've learned are kind of basic necessities at that point are especially important to have in this situation. Yeah, this is probably the first year that um, this has all been in incorporated into your kit and should be. The Florida Division of Emergency Management just put out a new list that incorporated the stuff in the kit. So it's very important. So another thing uh, that I think a lot of people deal with is I have pets. So if I'm gonna evacuate, I know that I have to make sure where I'm going is pet friendly, whether that's a pet friendly shelter or a friend or a family members. And then thinking about the necessities your pets need as well as all of those things we thought about for us. So food and water and vet records and a carrier to bring them in. And then there's also some other situations where we might wanna think about special items that we should consider. So what are those, Jill? Well, not only, don't forget about your pets, but if you have infants or seniors or people with special needs, you wanna make sure that their needs are uh, taken care of as well. So you wanna make sure that you have enough infant formula on hand or the, going back to prescription medication for your seniors, you wanna make sure that you have all of their needs, especially if you need to evacuate or even if you need to uh, shelter in place. You wanna make sure you have that for at least two weeks. That's great, and so we've covered a lot of information in a short amount of time here. So if people want to go reference a checklist or see what they have and what they might want to consider, where can people learn more? Well, they can go to volusia.org slash emergency management, and there's lots of information on there, including our um, a downloadable emergency supply list that they can uh, pull up and they can get all the basic stuff is in there and um, more tips and tricks on how to keep yourself prepared during a disaster. Well, thanks for taking some time today to talk about preparing your kit. September is National Preparedness Month, and there's a lot we can do to be prepared for anything that happens in Florida. So again, thanks for helping us get everything ready, and it's a great time to prepare yourself for whatever may come. Welcome back, I'm Kevin Captain, Community Information Director for Volusia County Government. Today we're talking with Dr. Scott Cleos. He's an interventional radiologist with Radiology Associates Imaging and he practices at Halifax Health in Daytona Beach. And uh, we were talking, Dr. Cleos, about the, the coronavirus getting into our cells, the host cells, right. um, using our cellular machinery, kind of like a car factory, to make, to make copies of itself or uh, copies of a, a new BMW, if you will. Right. Uh, can you sum that up again and yeah, take so us to the next step? Yeah, so basically when we took our break, we got to a point where the cell, the virus has gained access to our cell. It has released its genetic material into the cytoplasm, and now it is being read by our ribosome. And as I said before the break, the ribosome makes protein. That's all it does. It doesn't replicate our DNA. All of our DNA replication happens inside of the nucleus protected into the kind of it's uh, sacrosanct. Everything in there is genetic material. Nothing goes in or out. So it's like a tight factory. Tight factory. Can't get in, there. Can't get in and out. So we the virus, it's kind of a free-for-all out in that cytoplasm. But it needs a way to reproduce its own genetic material, and that's what we're going to get to right now. Okay. So if we can play that next video, I can show you guys how that's done. Um, that's not the video. Oh, but like, they're making a kit. They're and making it's, a kit. And it's, well, uh, let's do the one before this. There should be one right before this. I'm not sure. This is, yeah, this is the one I want to see. Uh, no, is that right? Let's find out. Is there one in between these two? We want to talk about Okay, viral. just keep going. Just keep going with this. Just keep going with that first one <coughs> right there. So I think what's going to happen here, just kind of fast forward that one. Keep going, it shows keep that going. spike going into the cell. Yeah, so let's just see what happens. And here. that green thing you said was the lysosome. Lysis, that's the lysosome. lysosome. That's breaking down the proteins. You got the, this is a good summary. And okay. that's what hydrochloroquine affects. That theoretically, okay. So we talk about it being positive sense. It can actually be read directly by the ribosome because it looks just like the uh, RNA. So hopefully this is going to get to, is that it? That's the whole thing? Is there a number six? That's what I want to see. So this one shows like how it, 
how the factory works inside the cell. Did we play this one yet? Okay, go get So this is the one I want to see. Okay. So we're going to show you how SARS-CoV-2 causes you know, the coronavirus. Sorry, guys, for that little... So oh, it's this is great, it. okay. great images, though. So this comes to the ACE2 surface protein. Let's see if this actually... This is number six, correct? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's a... That's a surface. That's this is a there. surface protein, but I'm not sure if that's the right. The one I want to see is the one where we actually, and I don't, let me see if I can see it on our sheet here. Well, what we're, what we're talking about is, is the, the actual, like, viral replication. It viral gets into replication, our cells. Yeah. It, it yeah, takes it should over be viral replication number five, if you guys have that video. It, it takes over our machinery. Yes. Starts making copies of itself, but it's so it, it steals our energy as well, too, well, right? What happens is it actually can destroy the cells uh, that because once these viral particles start being made, it can actually destroy those little cells in there, cause damage. And when you get enough viral particles, the theoretic, uh, you know, disease, COVID-19, is caused by a aggressive immune response by our bodies. And you heard of this cytokine storm? You yes. know, basically it's the body's desperate attempt to overcome this virus that's now invading us. So in my personal theory, what's happening is you, you get to a critical mass of these viral particles. You never want to get to a critical mass. You want to get a little viral exposure, train your immune system to recognize this particular virus, and then uh, have the body develop an immunity to it. But if for some reason, if you're genetically predisposed, you're immunocompromised, whatever, the virus basically explodes Takes out over. of control, then the body's response is this cytokine storm. And we think that's the main pathophysiology of COVID-19, is once you start getting the cytokine storm, you start getting this inflammatory response in the lungs and in the you know, kidneys, and they get renal failure, and the GI tract, they get GI distress, and you can actually get little strokes because it, uh, it affects the blood vessels and it affects the, you know, in the head, and they get little petechial hemorrhages in their fingers and stuff like that. So it can be you know, multiple systems that uh, kind of succumb to a COVID-19 fulminant infection. But not everyone is going to go that route, and hopefully we're going to cover some of that in a moment, and I'll show you guys why some may be more susceptible than others. Okay, so okay. I think we have that video ready. Okay, let's, let's see what happens here. It's showing the, okay. the replication. All right, I think this might be it here. So what we're going to do, there's no genetic replication uh, organelles in the cytoplasm, as we talked about. So all this thing can do right now is make protein. But so think of this as a machine. This is a machine, okay. So... And, and that's the ribosome. This is the ribosome right here. The ribosome is the protein. And the ribosome consists of these two units. There's like a, you know, there's like a big and a small unit. But so what happens is the first 20,000 bases, remember there's 30,000 bases? The first 20,000 are dedicated to this protein right here, okay? And it's called an RNA-dependent RNA preliminase or RNA replicase. So let's stop right there. So again, I'm going back to the, like if this was, if we're building a car, this is spitting out a part 20,000 That's parts exactly there. right. This okay. is taking 20,000 of those 30,000 Just making pairs. copy, 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 well, copy. Well, no, before it does that, it is making this particular device right here. Okay. This particular piece of, this is the engine, okay? Let's, uh, you know, okay. equate it to the engine of the virus, all right? This is the link between our ribosome and viral reproduction. So the first 20,000, that first vi viral D, uh, RNA is dedicated to the production of this protein right here, which is an RNA-dependent RNA preliminase or RNA replicase. This thing is involved in multiple steps of viral replication, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. So this may be a very useful target for treatment, right? I mean, eventually- Because you then you're, you're stopping the engine. If you don't have this, the virus can't reproduce. It can't reproduce at all. So, you know, I, they've got some things that are, that they, you know, there's, um, uh, um, there's remdesivir that stops reproduction at a certain phase, but I don't think anything as of to date has described stopping this particular production of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase or RNA replicase. But that's going to be interesting. If somebody comes up with this, I think you could stop this virus dead in its tracks. So, all right, let's continue with that virus. So what this does is it now reads that same positive strand 
um, RNA, okay, the same thing that it just made this protein with, so maybe another copy of it, and it produces a negative copy of it, okay? This is the positive. All right, let's stop right, uh, we've got a little bit for right there. So, so we right talked there, earlier like the spiral staircase, and that's building the other end of the step. That's exactly right. So you see I have the uracil, the adenosine, the cytosine, and the guanine. So what it's doing is it's taking that single strand of RNA, and it's making a negative copy of it. That's why this is, the original one is called a positive sense RNA, because it's the positive copy. The negative sense is the basically this process where you're matching up the U to the A and the G to the C. So that engine that you were just showing is, is actually creating a complementary pair to perfect, that. Perfect to that, way to summarize. Okay. A complementary so pair to that genetic material. Okay. To that genetic RNA strand. But still for simplicity's sake, it's it's an engine, we're making copies, it, it's it's stealing our manufacturing process. We're not done yet. It's going to do a lot okay. more than what we just talked okay. about. So let's go back to that video. So yeah, so basically it's making a negative copy, which I've shown in blue right there. So that's the, that's the positive sense RNA in the red, and the negative sense RNA is in blue. Now, this RNA dependent RNA um, uh, polymerase can then read that negative sense RNA. All right, stop right there for a second. It, that negative sense RNA cannot be read by the ribosomes, all right? It's not the same as the messenger RNA. It's big just a cud. Right. right. But it's doing it fast. It's just doing it. I mean, once you get enough viral particles, there's these things are all over the place. Okay, you don't, that's why viral load is so important, because the more of these things that are going on inside the cells, the more chance you're going to have of getting COVID. If you get a little infection, you know, you get a little exposure, your body can probably handle this and kill this off before it becomes a problem. But if you get a big enough exposure, you know, or you're g genetically susceptible to this particular virus, mm -hmm. you're going to have more symptomatology, right? And then that because that's because you don't have the defense mechanisms. You don't have the defenses, right? Okay. So let's continue here. So now you've got a positive. And if you read the whole genetic co uh, code from that negative sense, stop right there. You make another full copy, full copy of that genetic code, and this is the original genetic. RNA of the virus, okay? That's called genomic re replication because you take the entire genome and make another copy, all right? Now, you can also read this again, all right? You can read that negative sense again. Let's go again with the video. So it can read that negative sense again and it can make little short segments of positive strand RNA like this, okay? Stop right there. And these are the these are the pieces of positive sense RNA that encode for all those different proteins I told you about. Okay. okay. So now you've got the positive sense RNA that can make the spike and the nucleocapsid and the membrane and the envelope proteins. So now, let's keep going. All of these are, can then be read by our ribosomes. All right, so the ribosomes come back into play. You see how So these are all, these little, the, these little pieces here, if, if again, if I go back to that car factory, an analogy. Stop right here. That's like the trunk, the wheels, that's the, exactly right. the, the that's tires. A, that's what you're going to see right here. That's exactly right. You're making all the parts of the virus. So okay. All, all inside the cell, but not in the not in the nucleus. Not in the nucleus. Little in the cytoplasm, not in the nucleus. Okay. Okay, so continue. So there's the spike proteins, and then you're going to get the membrane proteins right here, and then these are going to be the nuclear capsid, and then you're going to make the envelope right here. And then these are all assembled in another area of the cytoplasm, and they come together to form a new viral particle loaded with that piece of, of RNA that we made, the full genomic uh, replication. It basically it gets encapsulated, and through exocytosis and budding, the virus makes it out of the body, or uh, makes it out of the cell, I should say. Okay, so now it's available to either go and infect other cells in our body, or you can cough it, or sneeze it out, or defecate it out, whichever way, or, you know, urinate it out, and it gets into the environment, possibly picked up by another host. Does that make sense? Wow, it so does. Far? So in other words, I mean, it's still it's stealing our stuff, and, and it's it's making. Uh, is it millions or billions of copies? Millions, billions, who knows? I mean, okay. probably, yeah, somewhere in there. <laughs> and, and so is it, is it efficient? Uh, no, it's, it's very efficient but very inaccurate, which is a problem. And okay. we're going to talk about that in a minute. So just to kind of, you know, uh, make this more clear, I've got a little summary video right here, which we can play right now. And I just want to kind of go over that in kind of graph form. So this is the whole process right here. 
and we're going to go up and uh, see the different components. So the virus enters the host cell, that positive sense RNA enters the cytoplasm, which can be read directly by our ribosomes, and the first 20,000 bases make this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, all right? The replicase, or RNA, can then read the original RNA to make a negative sense copy, all right? That's the template. Now, two things can happen here, all right? So one, it can go back and read that negative sense and make little subgenomic transcription, which makes these little, little pieces of positive sense RNA, which then form all of the protein components of the transport vehicle of the virus. Or you can replicate the entire genomic sequence and make a copy of the RNA itself, the genetic material. Those are all patched packaged together with the protein um, structures to make the new viral particle, which then exits the cell, okay? So that, I, I look at that as those are the assembly lines. That's right. All right, stop right, uh, yeah, you could stop right, that's okay, we can go back to that. That is the assembly line. So okay. that's the summary of the assembly line, making all the different products. Again, you know, you're in the Ford factory making Fiat's and, you know, we can't use any of the stuff that they're making, but it uses our stuff to reproduce itself. So that's how a virus works. Interesting. Yeah. Well, um, if it's, if it's not, if it's not, if you said it's efficient, but it's not accurate. Oh yeah. No, We've heard that coronavirus is, or, or, or SARS-CoV-2 is. Which is the coronavirus. Is a form of the coronavirus. Adaptable correct? to the environment. Right. How is, it, how is it adaptable to the environment? Because we also hear a lot about the, the virus, so to speak, mutating or becoming adaptable. Yeah. How does that work? Okay, let's play this next video right here. And we're gonna see if we can clear this up for you with this uh, video. So again, it's a single-stranded RNA replication. So right there, it's inefficient because you only have one strand. It's DNA independent. We're not using DNA at the all. The staircase isn't completely built. No. So it's right only there. half. Okay. Horribly inaccurate, okay, because you have one strand and sometimes you can get, you know, coding errors, whatever, and you can get what's called a mutation. If you get a coding error in your genetic material, that ends up as a mutation. In us, you know, get coding errors and that can cause cancers and can cause stuff like that. So we don't want coding errors. Most of the coding errors in this virus are probably going to result in viral death. But this is happening millions or billions of times a day, all right? Every now and then, you may come up with a mutation that may make that one viral particle adapt to that particular environment. So it'll make it more successful. It's like a Darwinian process in a little microcosm right there inside of our cells. So if one of those viruses is actually able to get a genetic mutation that adapts it to a treatment, you know, a vaccine, then it's no longer going to be efficient for treating that particular virus. And that's the concern. Do you, do you know, we don't have a vaccine for HIV. Have you ever heard of a vaccine for HIV? They've heard studies, but that nothing It's never real, been effective because yeah. they can't really target a vaccine against this virus. We have effective treatments because the you know, treatments are usually multi-drug treatments where we go in and we target multiple steps in the replication process. And that's how they keep the stuff like, you know, hepatitis and HIV under control. So people live with it. They don't die from it, but they never get rid of it. Now I think they've got some treatments that are effective enough where the body can actually take care and of it. Some of that is just part of human evolution, That's right? That's exactly this, 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 in it, this, this inefficiency, so to well, speak. Well, that is, all of this is a genetic and an evolutionary dance, right? So the <laughs> virus is trying to make itself survive. So it will adapt to its environment. We're trying to survive. So if this virus, come, a good virus doesn't kill its host, right? It doesn't want to kill you. It just wants to use your it machinery. It just wants to hi hijack it wants to our, hijack you. Yeah. And if it could live with you for the rest of your life and just reproduce itself, it would love that. So the virus doesn't want to kill you. A, a virus that kills you rapidly is an ineffective virus because it's going to die along with the host. A good virus is one that infects you, gets spread around, comes back year after year, like the cold virus, which can be a coronavirus. Or, or, or just influenza, regular influenza. Or regular influenza. These are all viruses that are sustainable. And again, we as the host may uh, succumb to the virus or the new viral particle when it first comes out because we're going to be most susceptible because we've never seen it before. It's going to eliminate the members of the population that are most susceptible, right? So the ones that are left may have a genetic variation that's going to make them live in symbiosis with this virus and not succumb to it. 
So that's what we're talking about. You know, once you get this, you know, herd immunity and this exposure to the population, we're trying to get to a point where we're living with this virus. Because I'm going to tell you, it's never going away. We're never going to see coronavirus. It's out there forever. It's out there right? forever. So, you know, thinking that closing schools down, doing all this other stuff is going to make this virus better. It's not. It's just kicking the can down the road. We have to learn how to live with we it. We have to learn how to live with it. And there are members of society that are going to be more susceptible. We have to respect them, for sure, okay? Because there are people who are immunocompromised, who may have cancer or a liver transplant. And if they want you to put your mask on, put your mask on. Okay? That's a nice thing to do. Um, I have seen people die from the coronavirus. I have seen people succumb to it. Most of the people I've seen with this are mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic. So most of us, I don't think, are going to have a bad course with it. But, you know, at some point in time, we have to return to some semblance of normalcy. And I may be a little adamant about this because I have two kids in college. One of them just starting right now as a first year. And I think their college experience is muted because we're uh, a little extreme in our response. And I, I want to protect members of society, but you know, we at the same time have to live our lives and just be respectful to those that may be more susceptible. We're hopefully going to go into that in a minute, but there is, we now know there's a sub segment of the population that may have a rougher course with an exposure. Yeah, you know, we, we know that COVID-19 affects uh, uh, people differently. And, right. you know, we're, I'm hearing that there's people out there, like we talked about before, some have no symptoms, they're completely asymptomatic, uh, and some are completely overcome or what you said before was a fulminant infection. Right. Does that have to do with genetics, or how, how, how does that work? It, it, part of it could be genetics. Part of it could be your baseline health, all right? I think we've got, I think the next video, let's see what comes up here. You know, so, all right. All right, so we'll, we'll continue with this just to kind of summarize what we just talked okay. about. All right. And again, you know, we just talked about, you know, making this unregulated transcription. Uh, this thing will read its own DNA, uh, RNA. It'll read the RNA of another virus particle, maybe even another species of virus, all right? So, you know, this thing uh, can have coding errors, and you can have multiple different strands that can combine into a new viral particle, which we didn't talk about, which is called genetic chimerism. All right, and the chimera is from Greek mythology. There's a picture of it here, and it's got the head of a goat, the body of a lion, and a serpent tail. And what it represents, let's stop right there, is a combination of different organisms into one. So they think that this SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19, is a chimeric combination of existing coronaviruses. Continue with the video here. So um, in other words, when you're talking about this chimerism, you're referring to the, the virus inside our body making copies of itself that's, that's not accurate. Right. So it's kind of like the, the, the car factory has no organization or it's no sloppy. shop foreman, no supervisor. Right. Um, and it's not making BMWs, it's making uh, lower quality cars. Yeah, whatever those are. We won't, <laughs> we won't come out with name any name. But even worse than that, it may be taking parts from the lower quality car and the BMW and combining them into a new car, all right? And that's what chimerism is, okay. all right? So we think, we think that this you know, is a combination of maybe a coronavirus from a bat and another animal like the pangolin, which I just showed you up there, which is an armored anteater. And, you know, because of the eating habits in some of these countries like China, where they have these live markets, you know, they're exposed to these things that ordinarily we wouldn't see. So, you know, if one of those, if they had a meal that had, was infected with a coronavirus and they ate both those animals and they got into one person, because of this kind of haphazard replication, they can take genetic material from both of these different viral species, combine it into a new viral species. And that's where they think this thing might have come from. I mean, I've heard the theories that it's created in a lab. I, I don't think that's true. I, I really think that this is truly a chimeric Just combination of existing coronavirus nature that happens its, in nature. Yeah. And some of it is, you know, the way you live. You know, if you're going to be eating weird stuff, you know, in live markets, you're going to increase your risk of getting something like this, for sure. Because of the inaccuracies of, of, the the, inaccuracies. of the genetic material. That's exactly right. Okay, so, so going back to the those that are susceptible. Yes, okay. So if we show that next video here, I hope this isn't too overwhelming for you guys, a lot of information, but- uh, we'll Well, it, it makes sense when we, when we try to uh, give comparisons to it. Yeah, you okay. Know? All right, so there should be a video on the reticular endothelial system, number seven is what I'm looking for. 
And, uh, and that would, that would discuss the then case. like why certain people. So this is the ACE2 receptor right here, okay? And I hate that word receptor. It's actually the angiotensin converting enzyme two. And uh, let's stop right there. So what is this? Is this the membrane? This is the cell membrane, yeah. Okay. This is the cell membrane. And that's a little door that goes into the cell? This is a little, it's not even a door, okay? So the original purpose of ACE2 is it's part of something called the retic uh, um, renin angiotensin system. Uh, hopefully this is the video that shows all of that here in a second. But this is a transmural protein. It contains zinc and it contains a protein base that goes through one side of the cell membrane to the outside. It's found in the lungs, the GI tract, the kidneys, and the blood vessels. Go ahead and keep playing this for me here. And that's why you see some of the diseases that we see, like respiratory distress, and DI, GI distress, renal failure, dementia, all right? So the spectrum of clinical response, as you said earlier, is very variable. A patient can be completely asymptomatic and they can die, everything in between, and that may be some variability between the configuration and number of the ACE2 transmural proteins because this is the doorway that the virus uses to actually get into the body, okay? So this may be a, a potential target of why some people are sicker than others when they get exposed to the SARS-CoV-2. All right, so we're gonna talk about this right here, and I'm gonna stop the video right, a uh, well, little bit more, right there. So we're gonna stop right here. To understand what ACE2 does, we have to understand this system right here, the renin-angiotensin system. RAS. RAS. And it is basically involves the kidney, which you see to the left of your screen, the liver in the middle, and the lungs all the way to the right. That is a blood vessel down in the corner there. And the last thing is the adrenal gland, all right? So that's, the, all, the, that's all the components of this renin-angiotensin system, okay? So these organs have that ACE doorway? Nope, I don't know. They, they, they may, okay. okay, but that's not what I'm showing you right okay. here. This is how ACE, ACE was not developed for the virus to get into our bodies, right? ACE2 was not developed. We already have it. We already had it. It just figured out how to use that to gain entry into our body. Smart little and devil. And ACE2 is all over our body, and I'm gonna show you what it does here in a minute, okay? So we're going back to that video. What this does, this renin-angiotensin system, is a closed loop feedback that helps maintain renal blood flow, okay? Which is very important, so stop right there. So the kidney's main job is to filter nitrogen waste from the body. Nitrogen comes from the breakdown of proteins in our body, and when you get breakdown, you have to urinate that out. That's what the kidneys do. Those are the nitrogen products. So it requires, go ahead and keep playing here, a lot of blood flow. And the kidneys get about 25% of all the blood that comes out of the heart. So every time the heart beats, 25% of all that blood goes to the kidneys. Okay, stop right there. So if, we, if something happens where the kidney is not getting the blood it needs to do its job, it can actually start secreting a chemical to make everything work harder so it gets its blood supply. All right, now it can, that, keep going with the video. What happens is you can either get a narrowing in that vessel right there, that's called a renal artery stenosis, stop right there, or you can have like heart failure. If your heart's not beating well, your kidneys aren't getting enough blood, and they just say, we're not getting enough blood, so they start secreting this, this chemical, and this chemical is called renin. Go ahead and keep continuing. And that's right what, here. that jump starts the That's jump starts kidney. this process right here. So the renin comes out of the kidney, gets secreted in the blood, comes up to this thing called angiotensinogen, which comes out of the liver, converts it to angiotensin 1, okay? Let's stop right there. So the next step in this process is inside the lungs, there is an enzyme that's called angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, A-C-E. That comes in, converts this angiotensin 1, keep going, to angiotensin 2, all right? Angiotensin 2 is the active form of this hormone right now. So what angiotensin 2 does is it acts on both of these structures, the artery and the adrenal gland. In the artery, it actually causes vasoconstriction of the peripheral vessels, and in the adrenal gland, it causes it to uh, secrete another hormone called aldosterone. All right, and aldosterone causes the kidneys to resorb more salt and water from the urine. So this combination, stop right there, of vascular constriction and salt and water retention raises our blood pressure, okay? Mm -hmm. So we know that this will raise our blood pressure. This is a treatable cause of hypertension in young patients. If they've got a narrowing in their blood vessel, 
I can go in and try to open that blood vessel back up and try to restore blood flow and reduce this renin secretion from the kidney. And that's what you do as an interventional yes. radiologist. Yes. You're, you're always opening those, those, those constricted uh, vascular. Muscles. Yep, that's one of the things we do. So we restore blood flow and hopefully the See, patients that, are See, that is why you're an expert in COVID. <laughs> no, 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 just the, just the vessel part, just the <laughs> vessel part. All right, so that's the whole renin angiotensin. So keep playing through this, we'll finish this up, and then we'll go to the next video. So that whole combination, you know, uh, basically, this is again just summarizing, narrowing is going to the kidney, renin is secreted, renin converts the angiotensinogen from the liver into angiotensin 1, and then from the lungs, you get ACE, ACE, or angiotensin converting enzyme, converting angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which is the active form of this hormone, right? And then the angiotensin II goes to the kidneys and the adrenal glands. It causes vasoconstriction. It causes the adrenal glands to actually secrete aldosterone, which resorbs more salt and water from the urine. And that combination increases blood pressure, all right? And so all the kidneys are happy again. Does that all make sense? It does, because now we're going back to the, the it, it, it makes a little bit more sense with, with patients or people that have, uh, lung problems, right, uh, kidney right. problems. So the kidneys, the lungs, the adrenal gland, like you said, those are organs that have um, this, that are affected by this ACE receptor that the virus can work its way in and cause more damage. That's another component to this, which we're gonna go into right now. So let's go to this next video. I hope you guys are hanging with us here. So <laughs> the next video is going to show you this ACE2 metalloprotein, all right? So again, what happens is, this is the ACE2 metalloprotein that we talked about, so that's up. And this is a angiotensin converting enzyme two. Let's stop right there, okay. This is a, again, existing protein that's in our, our bodies. cell membranes. This is the thing that's found, like you said, in the liver or in the kidneys or in the blood vessels. This is it right here. Okay. Now, the way this works in the, or in the uh, renin angiotensin system is this little chemical here called shedase will come down, and go ahead and play the video, and it actually cleaves off the outside of this little uh, transmural protein, and Let's this is the part that actually acts on angiotensin II, converts angiotensin II to angiotensin 1-7. All it right. looks like you just cut an avocado open and took the seed out of it. Okay, stop right there. Now this is a little poetic license. You know, this is not, you know, this is just kind of demonstrating you're not really, you know, doing all of this stuff to it. As a matter of fact, you're actually cleaving a molecule down starting from the liver. I added to it. So this is done. I want you to think we're adding stuff to angiotensin. But the visual is good because it helps us understand so right. what's happening. That's exactly right. So now this angiotensin 1-7, just stop right there, is an antioxidant. It's a vasodilator. Okay, so it actually has advantages. It, it kind of scavenges free radicals in our body and it causes vasodilation. So is that why people with high blood pressure who take ACE inhibitors like lisinopril and okay. some of those other ones, is that why? That's that a good question. That affects this entire system right here. Okay. And that blocks that ACE conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. But I'm not going to get into that okay. now because that's kind of a whole other topic. If someone has a question, we can go into it at the end here. But so going back to this, this angiotensin 1-7, go ahead and play the video, actually now goes back to the artery and it does the opposite. It causes vasodilation and it stops the adrenals from producing aldosterone. So it's a counter response to the RAS, the renin angiotensin system, all right? And so now we've got some way to balance that effect. So this is how the ACE2 functions in our body. And I don't like that they use this as the ACE2 receptor. It is not a receptor. Okay. It is an enzyme in our body that converts, that works on the renin angiotensin system and actually has a function. SARS-CoV-2 uses that as a target. It looks for this particular metalloprotein and it attaches to it, which is pretty smart because that thing now knows that this is located in all these different parts of our body and if it attaches to it, it can get into critical areas of the body, like the lungs, or it can get into our blood vessels, or it can get into our kidneys or our GI tract. And it's kind of interesting because these are all areas where the virus can actually make it back out of the body, right? So if the virus gets into the lungs and actually gets excreted into the um, alveoli, you can cough and sneeze it out. That's the way it gets out of the body, okay? If it gets into the GI tract, you can defecate it out, right? So now it's in the environment to get picked up by another host, possibly. 
If it gets into the kidneys, you can urinate it out. So it's kind of interesting all these different areas that it is used to gain access to the cells because now it can get out and spread itself. If it gets into the blood vessels, you know, if another animal eats that animal that's infected, you know, they get the viral particle from the blood probably. So is that what makes uh, SARS-CoV-2 so so contagious? Yeah, so it's very infectious, supposedly, okay? So people get it, but just because you have the virus does not, again, mean that you've got COVID, right? So right. you can get right. the virus and you can get exposed to it. And there's some patients will tell you, say, I tested, I was positive, never had a symptom. And that's not unusual. So besides a mask, uh, that, that really weighs into the importance of not just wearing a mask, because that would cover the, the lungs and the aerosolization of what you, what you expire, but hand washing, and you said urinating, defecating, all of that could Wash carry the virus. Well, that, it's interesting. We, we've impl we've uh, uh, implemented a lot of personal hygiene stuff, which we should have been doing all along. Sure. So now we see, you know, a reduction in the number of patients who are actually getting, you know, SARS-CoV-2, or I should say fulminant COVID infections. Hopefully, they're just getting a small dose, and that's what the personal protection, you know, the equipment is doing for them, getting a small dose that their body can handle. But we're not only seeing a decrease in the number of deaths from COVID, we're seeing the decrease in the number of incidents of influenza that we would see this time of year. If you look statistically, that's dropped off dramatically. So this personal hygiene is actually helping us in multiple facets of our personal health. Having said that, I don't think we want to be overzealous. Some people are going bananas. You know, they don't want to go out. They don't, right. They're washing their hands constantly. There's ramifications and repercussions for being too clean as well. You know, the allergists will tell you, years ago we kept our babies too clean, and that's why they were allergic to everything they came in contact with, you know, because they never saw a peanut. Because you they never need saw those things to build immunity. That's how our immune system works. You need to be exposed to this stuff in order for your body to develop a response or know that it is a normal component of the environment and it doesn't have to go bananas when you get exposed to it. So when, when we get older, obviously we lose our ability to have that natural defense or that over, overwhelming force of things. And, and if we look at the demographics of Volusia County, I think it's about 23% of our population is 65 years of age or older. Right. And um, when we look at how how COVID-19 is affecting different cities and states throughout the country and even uh, in the world, like our population is very similar to, let's say, Milan, Italy. And uh, we're at increased risk, right? Because we're, we have an older population. Theoretically, we're at increased risk. I don't know if statistically it's actually showing that we have a higher incidence of, you know, death from this. I don't think that's true. Now, one of the things about the Italian population, uh, you've been to Italy. I know you went there for I, your honeymoon. I right? did, yes. Okay, so my I, wife and, reminds and my, me of going back because I, I put a coin in Trevi Fountain, so I yeah, have to go back. Exactly. <laughs> so my wife, is her family's from Italy. She speaks Italian. We go over there. And I just know they got hit hard. With they us. got hit hard, but they're... they're um, uh, culture is very different from ours. When you go over there and I meet Andrea's relatives, male and female, they've never met you before. They will hug you, kiss you on the cheek two times, three times. I, said, well, this? I don't know why it's three times, but they kiss you on both cheeks three <laughs> times. It's great. I mean, you really felt welcomed over there. But I think that was before we knew what was going on. Makes sense. That was their culture. And they were in close contact. And if you, you know, have a runny nose and you've wiped your face and then someone's kissing you on the cheek, right. that's probably spreading. You're probably getting a big viral dose with that, too, because they're probably really, really sick. Because those areas are going back right. to that ACE receptor. Yeah. And I think we're going to see resurgence of this, you know, time and time again. And we're going to have to take precautions to make sure that we don't, you know, spread this uh, uh, you know, irresponsibly through the environment and through the population. So, you know, we're going to see it again. But I think they learned, but they've kind of had a, you know, a dramatic response to their, you know, uh, unfortunate situation. And they've kind of limited travel over there. We haven't been back. And, right. you know, they're quarantining everyone. And, you know, we talked to some of the people up in the villages up there, and they haven't, they haven't let them out of their house for like two months. You know, it was ridiculous. So I think there's a happy medium to deal with this. Well, there's still so much more information to learn about it, but one thing I just wanted to ask you before we close is that um, we're hearing and we're learning more about the virus and how it's Absolutely. affecting Every us. Every day. And the, the latest buzz that we've been hearing is that people lose their sense of smell or taste. Yes. How does, how does that, have you? Okay, let's play this video right here. I know we're running out well, of time. you got a video for that. I got a video for, I got a video <laughs> for everything here. So this is just gonna show you how 
you know, this all works. And this is chemical odorants come into our nose and they basically attach to these little, you know, uh, neurons, which are called olfactory receptor neurons. And they cause them to fire and they send a signal up to the olfactory bulb. Let's stop right there. And that collects all of this signal and then sends it to the frontal lobes of our brain where they're processed and that's how we smell stuff. Okay, so you know this is the whole body. And remember, you know the virus. Where is it likely to come into your body? Right through your nose. Sure. Right. Okay. So this is which is why a mask is so important. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it, mask isn't going to work if you're sitting in a room with aerosolized particles all over you in the biocontainment unit. But out in general public, it stops you from getting sneezed on, coughed on, you know, droplets and stuff like that. So if we continue with this. All right, what's going to happen, if you look at this, the way our, our, our neurons work in our body is you have nerves, and there's a gap in between two nerves that come up against each other. And the, the gap is called a synapse. And the firing of the first neuron releases these chemicals into the synapse called neurotransmitters, which then go to the other nerve, and then they cause that nerve to fire. Okay, so it's a neurochemical process, and that's how this you know, neural sim, this neuronal sim, uh, signal gets transmitted to the brain. That's facilitated through these things called the myelin sheath. You want me to stop here? Or? Well, this is all the, this is basically how our nose communicates with our brain. Like, exactly right. It's so you've telling got neurons us what down we here, smell. And when they get fired, they go up and they try to communicate that signal up to the next neuron that goes up to the brain. Okay, and they got to go through this little gap right here. So all this myelin sheath is an insulator that's around the axon of these nerves, the long stem that comes off the axon. Like insulation it's, and an electrical it's exactly wire. exactly what it is. It is insulation and electrical wire. In between these, which we'll see in a moment here, are called the nodes of Ranvier, which we'll see in a moment. So you'll see this propagating down. And then the signal comes down the main nerve, and then it gets transmitted across the synapse to the next nerve, and then a signal jumps from these little, you know, through this um, uh, myelin sheath, stop right there, and it gets transmitted through these little nodes of Ranvier up to the brain. And that's how the signal gets for interpretation. The myelin sheath is not part of the nerve itself. Okay, it is actually supplied by these helper cells or glial cells, and that's what forms the myelin sheath around all of these nerves. So, if you damage these helper cells, go ahead and keep playing the video here. If you damage these helper cells, what happens is you're going to lose your myelin sheath. Have you ever heard of multiple sclerosis? Yes. Okay, so that's what we think happens here. The nerve itself is okay, but you're damaging the myelin sheath of the glial or, cells. Or the helper cells. The helper cells, and that makes, or the myelin itself, and it makes up, you know, basically, you know, the, the insulation, and that goes away, and the nerves no longer transmit, okay? So, stop right there. So, the helper cells also provide nutrients to the nerve, and so on and so forth. So, they do have a lot of functions. So, now when the signal comes into the nose, because you don't have your myelin sheath anymore, the electrical signal is weak. And it's too weak to cause degranulation. Just of those as if it was a, a regular electric, exactly electrical right. load without well, your, insulation. Your Wi Fi is not working because you don't have enough <laughs> there signal. There you go. Okay, it's now the same it thing. Sense. So your Wi Fi is not working. And so what happens is you don't get the propagation of that signal to the next neuron. All right, keep going. All right. So they have recently found out that we have these helper cells inside our nasal passages that support all of these neurons inside of our nose. So it goes back to that ACE thing again. Well, I'm going to show you why. So all of these little things have helper cells which make this myelin sheath. They're called a different, a couple of different names. They're olfactory helper cells and they actually go by name like olfactory in sheathing cells or OECs. They're called olfactory in sheathing cells. I like helper cells. cells. That sounds, know, that's easy. much easier. Olfactory Schwann cells. These, the helper cells, actually contain the ACE2 surface protein, like we talked about before. So they can actually be, uh, the, the coronavirus can enter those cells and damage them. All right, so stop right there. So it's back, again, it goes back to that ACE receptor, or not a receptor, no, that no, ACE, receptor. that ACE, mad when you call that receptor. ACE thing. Yeah, that ACE um, thing. So is it like, uh, that's, the, that's the key to the message of, or to the doorway of the smell signal to our brain, and SARS-CoV-2 gets in there and and like puts a deadbolt on it. It damages those cells, and the the the, the cell, the the ACE2, is the target that gets in, gets the virus into the cell. Once it's in there, it damages that cell, and then that's what loses the myelin sheath. So theoretically, most patients are going to recover from this loss of smell. 
I had this. I'm going to tell you, it's dramatic. You had it. I had it. Well, I think I had it. My wife tested positive, confirmed positive, and she was sick, no fever. Two days after she tested positive, I lost my sense of smell. When I say you lose your sense of smell, you can't smell a thing. Peppermint gum, uh, Vicks Vapor Rub, barbecue gasoline, ribs, barbecue nothing. ribs. Nothing, I would be in man. trouble. It's uh, it's problematic. You can't even cook. You can't, you know. So it's it's a big problem because you know you can't smell anything at all, and you can't taste either. Which I'm yeah, because smell and taste are the same, right? Intimately associated. So you know. Uh, for me, it lasted about eight to 10 days. And when it first came back, what I would do is get this faint whiff of like peppermint. I'd say, oh, I think I smelled that. And it was transient, it would go away. But over time, I recovered. Now, I will tell you, when I had at the peak of this, I had a stuffy nose and I also have um, sleep apnea. So I wear a CPAP and I have these nasal pins. So I have to be able to breathe through my nose. So when I had all this, I was aggressively doing that nasal lavage with the neti pot. And I think that helped limit my symptomatology because it went away in about a week. On my YouTube channel, where I have some of these videos posted, I have people telling me they've lost their sense of smell for three months. Wow. And, you know, the original data said this is going to be temporary, but I don't know. Some of this may be permanent. And, again, I think it comes down to viral load. If you've got enough viral particles going up into your nose and you're doing enough damage to these little glial cells or helper cells, you may completely wipe out the population. They may never get their sense of smell back. So I've been advocating, and I have no scientific data to support any of this, but if you come down with this, I think it's important early on to do some kind of nasal lavage and you know, nasal hygiene where you're flushing through and trying to limit the amount of you know, infectious material that's available to damage these cells. It worked for me. That's all I can say. Well, as, as we try to get more back to normal, and we're seeing businesses adapt and our community adapt. When we're going into places, uh, you know, basically masks are, are required, uh, but we're also doing regular temperature checks. And it, it seems like what one of the things I got out of our conversation today was that so many people are asymptomatic, which I would imagine sometimes also means that they don't have a fever, right? But they could be carrying the virus. Uh, what are your thoughts on temperature checks <laughs> I'll and, tell you, Kev, and smells? That's a great question because anecdotally from what I've seen, a lot of people don't have a temperature. You know, that's one of the first, when I came in here today, you know, they checked my temperature, I've been normal, normal the whole time. My wife, who tested positive, had general malaise, she had a cough, she, you know, just felt like she had the flu, and was tested positive, never had a temperature at all. But she did lose her sense of smell, and I lost my sense of smell. And because, like I told you before, you know, your nasal passage is probably a pretty frequent, you know, entry point for this virus, most of us may actually have that symptom above and beyond temperature. I think you should screen. Could that be a way to test? I think so. You take a little, you know, a little, uh, a, a little test tube of coffee or peppermint. You say, what is this? And if the patient puts peppermint up to their <laughs> nose and like, I can't smell anything, it's like, you can't come in. Because <laughs> you may be symptomatic. That'd be and an interesting And I don't even know way. if those patients can spread the virus. But I think it's probably going to be a more sensitive test than temperature in the long run, I think. So, but we'll Interesting. See. Well, yeah. as we wrap things up, you know, we know that uh, obviously, um, you know, there's the, we talked about genetics and, and everything else. People with with comorbidities, with high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, obesity, um, you know, and in a lot of the people that that could be susceptible to it. What do you? What's your message to our community as far as hygiene practices? Because um, we're going to live with it. Yeah, it's not absolutely. going anywhere. It's got to become a part, a part of our life. And, and, and the whole purpose of the shutdown was to blunt that rise of cases so the hospitals weren't overwhelmed. And I think that's imperative that people get that message because it wasn't to cure this virus ever. It was so that we didn't overwhelm the healthcare system to a point where we couldn't take care of the sickest members of the population. And we've done that. I think it was effective. And we, you know, there's a lot of blame going on to, you know, community leaders, even our president, that they didn't respond. To, I think they did the best they could under the circumstances without being an alarmist, but we did that. I don't think we were overwhelmed, at least not down here in Florida. Other, you know, locales, they did have a problem. New York had a problem. California had a problem. But, you know, we've learned from those mistakes. And the most important thing we got to remember is that, you know, we've got to be respectful of our 
fellow human being. But, you know, it's time, I think, in my opinion, to return to some semblance of normal. So we figured out what segment of the population are most susceptible. I think it has a lot to do with these ACE2 metalloproteins because we know they're upregulated in chronic disease, like hypertension and diabetes and so on and so forth. So if you're overweight and you're diabetic and you're hypertensive, you need to protect yourself. You need to put a mask on. And if someone who's in that condition asks you to put a mask on, do the same. I really think we need to return to some semblance of normalcy. Again, I've got a little bit of a dog in this uh, fight because I got two kids in college and I think this extreme response and isolation is not appropriate. They are not the susceptible population. They may get the disease, I mean they may get the virus, but are very unlikely to actually get the disease. I have not been surprised yet of anyone who has succumbed to this, you know, SARS-CoV-2 and had fulminant COVID. The ones I've seen in that biocontainment unit are basically just what I described, obese, diabetic, multiple you know, issues going on there. And the occasional young person that dies, you can happen, it can happen, but it's probably from viral load. So you, know, you don't want to go out there and lick all over someone who's positive or go into a room with a whole bunch of positive people. There's ways to protect us, but it doesn't have to be this extreme response. And you know, I see the pictures in the paper of the, quote, irresponsible college students who are out partying. You know, and they're getting together and they're, they're, they're putting the society at risk. That's what we did. When we were in college, we partied. I mean, you know, you can't take that away from them. I think you got to let them live their lives. But when they're around people that may be susceptible, we have to have rules and regulations to protect those That's when you put that mask on Absolutely. And, and everything else. And then like, hopefully we're, like we're a see. safe distance here, but, you know, right. in, in, a, in a crowd, different story. Exactly. So you also said, too, in a previous uh, um, conference that we had, and I, I saw the video part of someone coughing and you could see the aerosolization of the droplet particles. Uh, as we get into fall, there'll be less humid uh, humidity in the air. Um, how does that affect the aerosolization? That. And yeah. you said something about the five second rule doesn't work. Yeah, no, no, no. That, uh, forget the five second rule. I mean, I, if anything hits the ground, you just leave it there because it's done. Probably a whole, yeah, it's done. You know, I, just I don't know where that somewhere. came from anyway. I don't know where that, I think that was just an old wives tale or something. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the, what you see in, you know, we've known, it's, it's amazing to me when I see these little articles come out about, oh, viruses are spread by aerosolization. Like, yes, we know that. Now, that's been, we also know that there's more of an incidence of infection during the cooler months and cooler locales because the, you know, lack of humidity allows these viral particles to extend further through the atmosphere. So if you cough, and if it's summer, all right, and there's humidity, those viral particles, let's say, will go three feet, and the water droplets in the air will pull that stuff to the ground. It's, it's like okay? a gra gravitational pull. It's like a pull. gravitational pull. Yeah. So that's where all that virus is on the ground. So don't pick anything up that ground and put it in your mouth, ever. I you know, wouldn't recommend So that's doing. where you said we should be taking our shoes off yes. when we get into the house. Yes, for if you're susceptible. I mean, okay. you know, if, if, you're, okay. if you know, early on when we didn't know how many people were going to die from this, we were a little extreme in our response, but we'd take the shoes off, we wouldn't walk around in the house with it. In the hospital, we have little stations set up where there's alcohol-covered uh, towels, and before you walk from one area to another, you have to step on this and basically step on in and get the alcohol so exposure it, to the sole of it your... It disinfects the, the disinfects bottom, of, the your bottom shoe. of your shoe. So you're not carrying it through the hospital. They've since taken that stuff up. You know, we okay. don't have it anymore. But these are the things that you've got to keep in mind. It doesn't, it's not an enigma. There's certain things about this virus we absolutely know are true based on our experience with other viruses. And that's why as we get into the cooler months, you may see a little bit of a resurgence. But I think we can deal with it. We have the technologies and the knowledge to basically mitigate the impact of a SARS-CoV-2 infection if we just pay attention. And the hospitals, they're cleaner than ever. Yes. Oh, right yeah. Now. Every place is cleaner than ever. I mean, you know, when the employees... My house is, I'll yeah, tell you so that. Yeah, so mine too. <laughs> you know, they're, if, you're, if they're not doing their job, you know, serving you or doing it, they're cleaning everywhere, so. Well, that's, that's, that's great. So, Dr. Cleos, this has been great information. I hope so. And so for, <laughs> for health care providers or for the, the Sheldon Coopers or the Amy uh, Farrah Fowlers of the world that are real technical, you said you had a YouTube channel. Yeah, I do. I have a YouTube channel. It's under, I just find it under Dr. Cleos, or I type in my last name, Cleos, and that's where they reside. So it's so. K-L-I-O-Z-E yep. for anybody who, who needs to know. So, well, I mean, this has certainly been one heck of an educational discussion. <laughs> um, Hopefully not overwhelming. It's, so. it's, it's, it's good to know, though, that we have very knowledgeable positions here in Volusia County, and, uh, you know, my brain is, is certainly 
overwhelmed at this point, but you know that's okay. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. My pleasure. Um, we certainly you appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us and, and making this complex topic uh, a little simpler to understand. Uh, on behalf of Volusia County, uh, we also thank Halifax Health and Radiology Associates Imaging, and thank you to all of our Facebook Live audience, to everyone listening today. Thank you so much for being here with us, Dr. Cleos. Hope to see you again. Absolutely. All right, with that, we'll end today. Take care, stay safe, and help your neighbors.